It's another day of working from home. Fortunately, we've got some uh, good space here to do it. Yeah, we've come to love this office. I had to clean it up a little bit today. This is uh, what we share. We got everything we needed to uh, to work from home. We're so fortunate to be able to be together and to work from home, to be able to pursue our work and passions digitally and to be safe. The upside of being largely locked down for the last year is that I haven't had to travel at all. I don't even have to commute to the office or, or go to meetings. It's freed up so much time. Yes, but actually it turns out there's a lot more work than I would have imagined, but it's also more, more time to appreciate nature and, and be with my family. Frankly, it's been an awakening of sorts. The opportunity to, to take walks every day outside, sometimes admittedly on work calls or, or webinars, but I hate to admit that uh, as I experienced the, the transition of nature from spring to the summer during my daily walks, I, I marveled at how spectacular nature was. In fact, I even asked some people, is it like this every year? Um, and I'm told it was, and I've, I've kind of been missing out, but I won't be missing out uh, in the future. Um, I am reminded, however, of, of those people who are on the wrong side of the digital divide, who, who aren't so blessed to have connectivity and the tools that they need. Even as the world is more connected, the World Economic Forum and the United Nations estimate that nearly half of our global population remains offline, unconnected to the digital world. That's probably over 3 billion people with a very high percentage in the less developed, poorer countries in the world. Two thirds of the world's school aged children, 1.3 billion children aged three to 17, do not have internet connections in their home, according to a joint report from UNICEF and the International Telecommunications Union branch of the United Nations. But too many people living in the United States and other developed countries are unconnected as well or, or digitally disadvantaged. In the US, about 14% of children aged three to 18 don't have internet access, meaning that more than 9 million school children face difficulty in completing assignments online and experiencing the virtual world. We all owe it to our neighbors to try to work together to close the digital divide to help the disadvantaged in the human race and help them lead fuller, healthier lives. We must collaborate to drive digital inclusion, to bring the benefits of technology to every person, home, and organization. We need to close the divide to facilitate the work of the present and the future, virtual education and training and so much more. UNESCO and the ITU Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development has set a target of connecting 75% of the world's population to fast internet via cable or wireless by 2025. This is an important goal. Let's try to contribute to this. The pandemic, the shutdowns revealed some things we should have known or should have paid attention to. For too many people who lack the skills and education and digital connectivity and tools to maximize their potential and quality of their lives. Too many are at higher health risk and are vulnerable to economic disruption. Those without high-speed connectivity are at an immense disadvantage, a fact never more evident than during the pandemic, when many have been able to maintain the quality of their employments and of their lives without major negative disruption, but too many others were not so fortunate. Before the pandemic, though, in the United States, about a third of US households had somewhat limited digital access, and that rose to 40% in the spring of last year when the pandemic struck. Virtual education can provide real value, particularly to those who have the devices to take advantage of it. Children, young adults, and older learners need to be able to do their homework, do research, connect with family and friends in, in other places. Those who seek more education, better training, and job opportunities need the wherewithal to do it. Computer literacy is often taken for granted, but can be a huge hurdle for the uninitiated including many older citizens. Regarding technology generally, we must collaborate and act strategically and proactively so we can leverage the promise and unlimited possibilities of technology to one, bridge the digital divide, two, maximize the benefits that technology can bring to our people and our economies by acting strategically and collaboratively, globally, nationally, and in our communities, and third, to empower our workforce to participate in the current industrial revolution. So what about this fourth industrial revolution? I'll call it the digital transformation revolution. 
World Economic Forum says significant economic and social value is gonna be generated by these business cases of 5G. One of the most important enablers that allows these technologies to reach their potential is connectivity. This new revolution is expected to bring about historic benefits, but potentially some negative consequences as well. We have to act strategically and proactively and collaboratively across government and the private sector to maximize the benefits and minimize the risk. An IHS market study estimates that $13.2 trillion in global economic value will be made possible by 2035, generating 22.3 million jobs in the 5G global value chain alone. What's this revolution all about? Well, 5G enabled technology will bring computing power to the end user, bringing dramatic transformation over the next three to 10 years. Not just speed, which some have gotten a, a hint of, but reduced latency, reduced lag time and an explosion in the number of connections possible in a small area. This makes it possible to deploy multiple sensors that are connected to device and control systems and computers, which in turn can leverage big data analytics. This industrial revolution is powered by both established and emerging technologies, including the internet of things, artificial intelligence, advanced data analytics, robotic process automation, robotics, cloud computing, virtual and augmented reality, 3D printing and drones. One major impact will be a potentially massive shift in the division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms. Automation will likely have a huge negative impact on certain kinds of jobs, often held by those with less education and fewer skills. A McKinsey report found that 14% of global workforce would have to switch occupations or acquire new skills by 2030 due to automation and artificial intelligence. Those with less education and minimal skill jobs are likely to be negatively impacted the most, with particular concerns about retail outlets like grocery stores and some manufacturing jobs. It's critically important that nations, to, if they wanna maximize the benefits to their people and minimize the consequences, need to collaborate strategically. That's between governments, telecom and mobile operators, equipment suppliers, other private organizations and public organizations and academia. And the collaboration needs to take place globally, nationally, and at the state and local level. It's also gonna be important to develop and implement security and privacy frameworks because of the inevitable growing dependence on the technology enabled worlds. We need to make sure that systems and services will be there when we need them. This will require recognized standards and best practices, conformance programs, and independent testing to promote assurance, transparency, and accountability. Workforce enablement is a very important part of the challenge. We need to learn from history so that we can try to anticipate the good things as well as the bad, perhaps more effectively than we did the downsides of globalization and the disruptions of the pandemic. We need to learn lessons from history. We need to be strategic and proactive when it comes to enabling and empowering citizens for the workforce of today and tomorrow. We cannot afford to be reactive as we were to the downsides of globalization and disruptions of the pandemic. Regarding workforce enablement, there are two critically important aspects. First, train and educate the undereducated and underskilled so they have a better chance of meaningful work going forward. Second, develop and implement a future of work strategy, preferably led by the private sector. Identify the knowledge and skills needed for a nation to compete in technology innovation and implementation. Take the case of globalization and with free trade. Many experts agree that globalization has raised standards of living in much of the world and has, been, has contributed to millions of people being raised out of poverty. But many were negatively impacted by globalization that should not have been entirely unexpected. But people have done too little to try to help those who lack the appropriate skills and education. So we need to think about the necessary educational and skill levels for workers for the future so we can anticipate and be prepared. Lessons from the pandemic that the underskilled and, and, and undereducated were the ones most negatively impacted by shutdowns or they had to work and put themselves at risk. After the pandemic, some lost jobs may not return. The haves need to help the have little and have nots raise their skills, upskill. If upskilling doesn't happen, technology innovation will leave many behind. 
Automation and robotics will make jobs obsolete. If we begin upskilling now, the workforce will have the appropriate skills to benefit from the current industrial revolution. Finally, we have to develop and implement a future of work strategy in countries because countries need a well-educated and well-trained workforce to compete in the world and for citizens to lead the fullest possible lives. Legacy approaches to education and training will not magically work going forward. Traditional academics are not for everyone. Collaboration is gonna be necessary to identify what are the necessary skills, what's the knowledge, what's the experience that the new workforce needs? How does the existing learning infrastructure need to be revised or perhaps a new one constructed for the benefit of current and future workers and today's and tomorrow's students? Developing and implementing national future of work strategies are worth considering to help inform a strategic path forward to reap the maximum benefits from technology and reduce the negative consequences of rapidly changing workforce requirements. So if we can please work together, thinking about what's necessary and possible, let's work together to close the digital divide. Let's identify requirements and launch infrastructure to train and educate the underskilled and undereducated. And let's launch future of work strategies so that the requirements of tomorrow can be identified today and going forward. So we can set up the means and the mechanism to train people so that they can participate in the fullest benefits of technology and lead the richest possible lives.